friends, we have come to the first Sunday after uh, Easter, and uh, the text is a familiar one. It is the story of uh, Thomas, who refused to believe that Jesus was alive until he said he would put his hand into his side and feel his nail-scarred uh, hands. Now, uh, I'm going to read the, the text, if I may, in just a moment. Typically, when I do a sermon, it works out to be about uh, 10 pages manuscript. Uh, today I have 27. That doesn't mean I'm going to talk that long, so don't worry about it. But uh, anyway, I'm going to read from John's Gospel, the 20th chapter. Fascinating. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear, fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Shalom. After he said this, he reached uh, in and showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw it was the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Shalom, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas who was called the twin, uh, the word used in the King James is Didymus. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the sword in his side, then I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, 
put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. The Greek says, uh, pistis ila pistis. Uh, do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Isn't that a word of hope for us all? Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I decided today, since it was 31 degrees here in the mountains when I got up, that uh, it would be nice to do this as a fireside chat. Some of our older folks may remember that when uh, FDR was president of the United States, he brought encouragement, he brought hope, uh, he brought inspiration to lots of folks because he did those fireside chats from the White House. I too would like to bring a word of hope and a word of encouragement to you this day. Poor Thomas, poor Thomas, he's been called throughout history, the doubter, the skeptic, that's the only way we speak of him. Even Jesus seemed to chastise him for having to see in order to believe. There are still many of us who are in that same position. Uh, Jesus places him in the ranks of a skeptic among the disciples. Now, that word for faith and the word for doubt come from the very same Greek root. And I quoted it for you just a moment ago. Right at the end of that 27th verse, Jesus says, Apistos, alopistos. Do not doubt, but believe. And that term pistos is where we get a whole branch of philosophy known as a epistemology. How can we know? Um, but it's like there are two sides of the same coin. It's as if you can't have one without the other. You can't have faith without having doubt. And so doubt is okay. It's all right to be a bit skeptical. It's a a little bit like we say of people that they are from Missouri. You have to show them. So if you doubt, do not be afraid. You are at the very edge of believing. Two days before Christmas, some 20 years ago, we lost from this earth one of the favorite people that I always held in admiration. He was a Danish uh, pianist by the name of Victor Borg. Uh, he had been an American citizen for over 50 years. In fact, the way that Victor Borg, if you, if you go back and look at his life, the way he got to America was when the Nazis invaded Denmark, he was doing a concert in Sweden. And so he was able to come to the United States and to take his place among us. But one of his usual routines was that he would sit down at the piano to play the music, and it would sound fine, and then suddenly he would stop and stare and have this kind of quizzical look on his face, and he would take the music, and then he would turn it over and put it back on the piano and begin playing, and it was an entirely different song. But it was a good song. And that was one of his favorite routines. In the same way, doubt and faith are just two sides of the same coin. In some ways, that is what doubt and faith are for us as followers of Jesus. Look at Simon Peter. What did he do after the crucifixion? 
he said, I'm going fishing. In other words, I'm going to go back to the same things I was doing before Jesus came. And so he was going back to be fishing. One of my good friends, um, who later became a bishop, Joe Bethay, African-American pastor, used to preach a sermon. And the title of the sermon was, And Peter. And it was taken from that text in the Bible, And Peter. And what he would say in that sermon was, you know, Jesus said to his disciples, Go and tell my disciples, and Peter, especially Peter, because Peter was not believing at that point. So let's not be too hard on poor Thomas. Let's not be so hard on him. I, I'm sort of reminded of the story of uh, a man who was walking along the side of a lake, and he had a dog with him. And another fellow came along. He said, let me show you my dog. He said, uh, uh, watch this. And he took a stick and he threw it way, way out into the water. And the dog jumped off of the bank and walked across the surface of the water, picked up the stick in his mouth and brought it back up to the shore. Never got his feet wet. And he said to the man who had walked up, what do you think of my dog? Said he can't swim, can he? Well, there are a lot of folks who look at life and, and they come to the wrong conclusions. There is a place where we have to move from what we can absolutely see and touch and feel to what we can believe. And that is the area of faith. So, it's little wonder that John followed this scene with that two-sentence statement. Now, Jesus did many other signs uh, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Kind of cuts us off right at that point. There's so much more that we could ask. But you know, doubt comes in many forms. There is the doubting spirit. There is the confronted spirit. And then there is the believing spirit. This text is a classic text about doubt. You know, Thomas is barely mentioned in the other Gospels. In fact, they only list him in the disciples. We know nothing about his life or what he is thinking, or what he is saying, until we get to John's Gospel. And John has three places in the Gospel where he has Thomas speak to us. Um, in the uh, second of those, we are in John 14, where Thomas is saying, uh, when Jesus says, I am going to be leaving you, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Thomas says, well, Lord, you say that you know the way, but we don't know the way. How can we know the way? Gives you a little insight into his character and his thinking process. The first time is when he speaks is when Lazarus has uh, died and the word has come to Jesus that his dear close friend Lazarus has died and he's going to go to Bethany to be with Mary and Martha. And the other disciples look at each other and say, we shouldn't go there, the Jews will kill us. But it's Thomas who says something very important. He says, well, if he's going to go, let us go with him so that we can die with him. Statement of faith, was it? I hope so. And then, of course, we come to this particular passage that we've read today. Now, we don't know a lot about, a lot about Thomas beyond this. Um, we don't know much more about him, but we get the tradition of the church, which says, and part of this comes from the confirmation 
of the Gospel of Thomas, which is a non-canonical book. That means it wasn't included in the list of books that were approved to be included in the New Testament. In fact, uh, Bishop Athanasius wrote his Christmas letter in the year 367, in which he listed out the books of the New Testament as we know them today. And there was a great effort to hide everything else that had come out, including the Gospel of Thomas. It wasn't found until December of 1945 when some, uh, some uh, folks were digging in Egypt uh, at a place called Nag Hammad, and they found the Nag Hammadi Library of all kinds of books, including the Gospel of Thomas. But Thomas, is, in the church tradition, left and in the year 52 went all the way to India. My wife and I have been to that town in India, in Kerala, India, where Thomas took the gospel message. Marco Polo spoke about it in his travels, saying that there were Christians and Jews in Kerala. And so Thomas became a spokesman for the Lord, risking his life and giving his life in missionary service. So let's not talk about him as doubting Thomas. Let's talk about him as believing Thomas, committed Thomas, the good apostle who, once he had seen Jesus, was transformed by the reality of the risen Lord and gave his life in the service of his Lord, spreading the good news to all those he came to know. I thank you for joining me here at the fireside. It's uh, nice to be next to a good fire on a cold, cold day in the mountains of North Carolina. God bless and let's pray. Dear God, we pray that prayer that we have heard before, O oh God, I believe, but please help my unbelief. Strengthen us in our faithful and, and committed journey following you, that in the afterglow of Easter, we may come to a new understanding and a new sense of your loving presence as our risen Savior. Grant to those who are suffering this day, especially those who have been touched by the terrible scourge of this virus, bless and heal and give strength and hope. And bless all of us as we walk together as a church in the face of this. And now may your word come to be alive again within us, and show forth as we do the works of Jesus in the world. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.